Good afternoon, I'm Rita Chelli. This is Ontario Today. In this hour... A man you can bait with a tweet is not a man we can trust with nuclear weapons. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. The board concludes in no uncertain terms that words matter. The threat is real. Where do we all fit in? Little rocket man, we can't have mad men out there shooting rockets all over the place. If anyone thinks such remarks that is nothing more than a dog's barking can frighten us, it is really a wild dream. Every year, the clock is set by the renowned scientists and security experts who consider whether the planet is safer today than it was a year ago. The board takes the unprecedented step, the first time in its history. Coming up, one of the scientists who helped set the doomsday clock. It is now two and a half minutes to midnight. North Korea just launched a missile. Crazy. Almost exactly one month ago, on August the 29th, the sirens sounded in Japan. Again, two weeks ago. Run, take cover, messages frozen on television screens. Can you imagine? How terrifying. And yet, the most useful thing to do seems to try to not feel anything at all. What are we supposed to do anyway? My only other touchstone is the 1980s, way beyond wham, leg warmers, and crunchy moosed up hair. The world was on edge. Russia and Reagan. The songs, the movies, they all kind of blur together. Although I do remember that weird puppet video by Genesis when the old president accidentally hits the nuclear button instead of nurse. How gutted I felt after seeing the day after. It was a made-for-TV movie, and the images of those melted human beings with wisps of hair, weeping sores, the so-called survivors of a nuclear holocaust. Those images stick. Talk about teenage angst. In the early 80s, the doomsday clock was at three minutes to midnight. Today, it's even closer. It's interesting to me to see that the nuclear issue, which over time has been has raised and lowered in importance, the public doesn't seem to think about it, but it is still the major threat, the major existential threat to civilization. And we still have a thousand nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert. Lawrence Krauss is our guest for the hour. He is the chair of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists Board of Sponsors, the group that sets the doomsday clock, the people who weigh just how close to the brink the world is today. A lot of us remember that song, of course, Sting, If the Russians Love Their Children Too. Transpose that to today. This is the toll-free number, one 817 8995 I am not structuring a question, at least not here at the beginning, because I know we all want to hear someone like our guest, who can talk about, perhaps even put into words, what we don't feel equipped to do. Maybe you relate to this, how sometimes, you know, you feel afraid, but you just press ignore because it seems like the only thing that's reasonable for you know ordinary mortals to do one triple eight eight one seven eight nine nine five professor lawrence kraus has an outstanding list of credentials where would i start he exists in an orbit of uh people like him who get very uh, prestigious scientific uh recognitions his connection of course which i just stated to the doomsday clock he is a theoretical physicist the director of the origins project at Arizona State University, the author of many, many books, including his latest, The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far, Why Are We Here? And Professor Lawrence Krauss is actually joining us by Skype from Oregon. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. It's nice to be with you virtually. <laughs> yeah, well, it, we're thrilled, actually, and I am, because I've thought about this a lot. You know, I have to engage an audience every day, and I think, how do I, how do I get at this? And so here you are with your unique insight and wisdom. Um, as someone who calibrates the angst of a civilization, I, I'm curious, actually, just to start, because I've played some music there. Do you have a cultural benchmark yourself, a movie, a song, something that speaks to you differently? 
Well, yeah, of course, we all do, I think. And that's, that's I think that's why I was happy you, you played the Sting song, because I think relating things to our uh, popular culture is a way to get people involved. Uh, the, the, the sort of nuclear threat in some ways is so overwhelming that I think many people would rather just not think about it mm -hmm. because it seems so terrifying. But we need to think about it. And, and, and the point is we shouldn't be, you know, the Doomsday Clock isn't, isn't designed to fill people with despair. The purpose of it, and it's been around for over 70 years from since the physicists who, who developed the atomic bomb decided they needed to alert the public to the dangers of nuclear weapons, is just that, is to get people thinking about these problems because it, 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 leader, it, it's obvious now in the world that our leaders are not going to lead. They're going to follow, and if the public is not does not demand a, a safer world, then they, they won't get it. And so I think that the, the the intent of the doomsday clock is to say, look, you know, we can do something about this. That if the if, if the public says, look, we just don't want to stand for a world in which we're increasing the number of nuclear weapons, in which we're modernizing our nuclear weapons, in which we we have thousands of weapons on on hair trigger alert when we don't need them. Then I think people will respond. Our politicians will respond, not because they necessarily, frankly, want to do the right thing, but because they want to be reelected. Hmm. It's a bit cynical, but perhaps true, right? Uh, let me ask you, just because we started with in the '80s that that Sting song. Um, <laughs> what what from your? I remember. I by the way, I remember an earlier movie called On the Beach, which really oh, dramatically yeah, yeah. affected me. I don't know if you you're probably too young for that. But no, but no... I know it's the what this. You might remind our audience, a submarine, right? Yeah, the submarine. Yeah, and it really, boy, it haunted me when I was a child. Which I mean, I'm not necessarily a good thing to do, but, but, uh, but I think what the problem, part of the problem is, the young the current generation has grown up in an era where we've had over 70 years since a nuclear weapon was used, and you know, and in the 1960s, I remember. Uh, uh, and by the way, I grew up in Canada. I didn't know if you knew that, but uh, I should uh, tell the audience you grew up in Toronto, and then you went to Carleton. I went to Carleton, in fact, and I'll, I'll hmm. for whatever matters, I'll be back there in October giving a public lecture. But but uh, even in Canada, I remember the fear that we get about about nuclear weapons. We didn't uh, we didn't have to go climb under our desks to to uh, in, in in efforts to try and uh, practice what you do in the event of a nuclear attack. But I had many friends in the states who who did. But but that doesn't happen anymore. And I, uh, well, and I, of course, it was ridiculous at the time. But I think people. I've also become a little bit complacent because nuclear weapons haven't been used in so long. The assumption is that we're fine, we're stable, and uh, and we don't have to do anything about it. The the, the 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 status quo works, but the but the status quo doesn't work. And and Einstein actually uh, said it very well. The minute we had nuclear weapons, he said everything has changed, save the way we think. And that's the point. We have to realize that these things are not useful weapons of war. And the world will be safer only when we reduce their number and maybe eventually get to zero, but certainly reduce their number. And and the nuclear nations need to act. Uh, you know, we we're sure we're worried about North Korea and people are worried about Iran, but there is a non-proliferation treaty, which which has been signed by most countries in the world, and the nuclear nations are not adhering to the treaty. Part of the treaty is not just that other nations will not acquire nuclear weapons. But the nuclear nations are supposed to work towards disarming. And mm -hmm. there's really no movement in that regard. In fact, both the United States and Russia are talking about modernizing their nuclear weapons fleet. Mm -hmm. That what message does that send to the rest of the world? I want you to talk a little bit more about you. You, you did you touched on it, the Doomsday Clock, because people might uh, have heard of it. Uh, they might have a DC comic <laughs> reference for it. But <laughs> because you raised Einstein, um, you know, just give us just a thumbnail history of where this came from. You know, the the scientists who were behind it way back when. It, well, yeah, and it's kind of daunting for me as chair of the board of sponsors now because the board of sponsors was created by Einstein, Albert Einstein and Robert Oppenheimer. Robert Oppenheimer was the physicist who led the Manhattan Project and the first atomic bomb. And the two of them created, uh, well, helped create the bulletin because because of the concerns after the first uh, use of nuclear weapons about the dangers of nuclear weapons and the need to alert the public. And the board of sponsors was a group of sp the distinguished scientists who were there to try and advise the bulletin on on issues including the doomsday clock and that and the clock has been around for over 70 years it's 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 been moved not always yearly uh but usually yearly or semi-yearly and and or at least it's been examined uh and it's moved from uh, the closest it's ever been is 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 two minutes to midnight the farthest is 17 to minute, minutes to midnight and, and you know a lot of people 
talk you, you, every year when we consider we we run we we run a symposium which we used to call the Doomsday Symposium, which was a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, looking at the real threats and then trying to assess whether the world was safer or not. And uh, and a lot of people have every time we said it have problems saying, oh, it's not it's not more dangerous now than it was in 1980 or 1953 or whatever. The point is, I will be the first to say it's not a highly scientific process. What's really important is whether the clock is moving forward or backward. The absolute value, whether we're really at two and a half minutes to midnight versus three minutes to midnight, as you said in your introduction, uh, I think one can debate those things. But there's no doubt, and the reason we moved it forward is that the world is getting more dangerous. And, and, uh, And so in any case, what we try and do is not move it in response to individual events. People often contact me and say, oh, you know, because of what happened in North Korea right now, because of what President Trump just said, shouldn't we move it right now? We try to take a, a, a longer term view. So, for instance, it wasn't moved at, 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 during the Cuban Missile Crisis at that time. Uh, but we, we try and look at the, at, the, at, at the global situation and ask what's happening in the world so, it, so we don't you know, sort of move it every, every day. And, and by the way, just to be clear, about 10 years ago, shortly after I, I, I became chair, uh, we started to consider not just nuclear weapons, but the broader sort of existential threats of facing mankind, including car- climate change, and, and and now we're considering biotechnology and cyber terrorism, those kind of things. And it's it, I think what's really important about the clock is as a symbol, and when we set the clock each year, for one day, tens of thousands of newspaper articles are, are talking about these issues, which normally aren't discussed. And I think that's what's important. The real the real motivation is to educate the public and get people interested enough to think about these kind of questions, which, you know, existential threats are just not the kind of things that are generally discussed in the news every day. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and for, you know, many good reasons. But, but it, once again, if, if people aren't alerted, the intent is not to get people to put their heads in, in the sand and, or, or wait till the end. Be, it is to say, we can do something about this. We've done things like this before. We, physicists and and the public for example um, uh, uh, were involved in the in the non-proliferation treaty and then there was a comprehensive best test ban treaty which by the way the United States hasn't ratified but we haven't we haven't tested nuclear weapons in the atmosphere or, or no country has since the 1990s there's a kind of international consensus and we can build that when the public starts to be upset about things it's ha- the public can actually make things happen and so that's what we're trying to do is reach directly to the public and say this is of interest to you uh help us do something about it so you meet again in november like uh, do you it's, physically all get together or is it we physically call? uh all get together there's a board of there's a the science and security board of the of the bulls and is the is the board that strictly sets the clock the board of of, of sponsors of which i'm the chair uh uh advises on that and i'm uh, of course at those meetings and so we we have a we we, we have a series of meetings we usually have uh, a, a one day long informational meeting where we bring in world experts to discuss various issues to try and help make us make sure we're, we're, we're grounded in reality. And then it's a long discussion. And it always amazes me, frankly, uh, although, of course, the, we, we keep it confidential exactly how, the, the details of what we're, we're discussing. But but it, it moves in many directions and then it arrives at a consensus. I'm always amazed each year at that we we sort of eventually come with a consensus. And, and the consensus is last year was clear that, uh, as, as you heard uh, the, 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 the executive director, Rachel Bronson, I heard in, 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 the, in the talking in, in early in the, in the show, we, we do feel that words matter when they come from the president and when they come, in this case, from the, from the head of North Korea or, or at that time, it was, it was the, the president of Russia. Uh, saber rattling matters when 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 we need to uh, uh in fact come back from the brink and and we're and that we we by the way i should say when we set the clock which we do in january we announce it usually at the end of january it was it was four days after trump uh, uh was mm. uh, came to power uh was inaugurated so uh, but we to- actually made the decision before he came to power based on on the statements he made and also ongoing situations in around the world including at that time north korea which we said was a an issue, but there are other areas. There's India and Pakistan. There's there's many places where we need to 
we need to look and ask, is this rational? Is what we're doing rational? And certainly, for example, this nonsense that's happening in North Korea now is not rational in any way. In fact, North Korea and South Korea had early on, in fact, discussed uh, bilateral talks to, to lead to a, 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 um, a nuclear-free area or at least a, a, a zone where, the, where nuclear weapons can be reduced. We need to ask, what are we doing to try and encourage countries to not have nuclear weapons? Is, is modernizing our own fleet encouraging them not to have nuclear weapons? Is potentially backing out of treaties we've made with countries about nuclear weapons does that tell people, countries, that they should enter into diplomatic relations with us? If I can, well, everything the United States is doing right now is, in my opinion, sending the wrong message. Professor Krauss, I just want to remind people, because we do have callers, I'd like to get a few in before we break for our local news sure. and weather. Uh, and, and just to clarify then, when you meet again in November, I get this picture in my head, like Knights of the Round Table and jury, <laughs> all, you know, jury, jurors, but um, will there be a new time set? Do you know in January? And the reason I'm asking is, of course, the, the Winter Olympics are in 2018 like start in February, which according to your timeline now means we would have possibly a readjustment of that hypothetical. I should underline that it is a hypothetical doomsday it, clock. There's no, there's no physical clock. I should make that clear. Well, look, we don't know. We don't have any commitment to move it. And there have been, there have been years when we haven't moved it at all. Okay. And uh, years, and I, I, and since I've been chair, we've moved it backwards. So it doesn't always go in one direction. Yeah, uh, although so. we're all listening to the news these days, but I won't put you, I won't cross-examine you on that. Let's go to Irwin in Toronto. Irwin, go right ahead. Hi, Lawrence. I taught you calculus and differential equations at Carlton, gave you an A-plus in both um, <laughs> years ago. And I also follow you on Discovery. I'm very aware of your tremendous contributions to physics and dark energy, expansion of the universe, etc. The question I want to Thank put you... So hold on, Irwin. You were his professor is what you're saying. Yes. Uh, Oh, yeah, Carlton, okay, go right yeah. ahead. Do you have a question for it? Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, recently, North Korea threatened the electromagnetic pulse attack on the United States. Could you please explain what that means and the implications for Canada? Well, look, yeah, I mean, I, I, once again, North Korea, first we should make it clear, North Korea makes lots of threats, but it's not clear it, it, whether that's bravado. It's not even clear that they can put a nuclear weapon on a, on a, on a missile, on a ballistic missile. So that... We should recognize that a lot of this is talk, and, and there's no clear evidence, but we should take it seriously. But electromagnetic pulse is just the fact if you explode a nuclear weapon in the atmosphere, it does produce, because of a rapid movement of charged particles, it produces an intense electromagnetic pulse that can knock out communication systems uh, over a region, over, in fact, potentially, as in some cases, depending on what you're doing, as large as the continental United States. It would have implications for Canada. But uh, uh, so that that kind of uh, explosion could have severe implications. Same thing that happens when there's a solar flare, by the way, when when, when uh, charged particles are moving past the Earth. Any extreme electromagnetic pulse will will generate currents in machines like computers. It's the reason we can charge iPhones now eventually uh, without without hooking them up. We just have changing electromagnetic fields that causes currents in the in the phone that can charge a battery. And uh, that same kind of that same kind of physics could could in principle be used to knock out communication systems. And for a long time, people have talked about using nuclear weapons to generate such a pulse. But once again, whether North Korea could do it or would do it, it would be, of course, insane for it to do it because. That's one of the problems. Can I it, it, actually, um, because you get to this, I, I really want to ask this question this way, because a friend of mine, you know, knowing that you were going to be on this program, actually reached out to me. But I think it gets into the you know, insane or nuts or unstable and unpre unpredictable, right? That for a long time, there's a feeling, at least, even among the, you know, un, the, the people like ordinary people, that, it, that some of this has worked because somewhere along the way, um, the strategy was working. And, and he was quoting um, Thomas Schelling in a New York Times. Uh, obituary, right? The idea of, you know, using the example of a driver in a game of chicken who rips off the steering wheel so his opponent can see that he no longer controls the car. And so once you know that your opponent has ripped off the steering wheel or detonated something, like you swerve because you know he's out of his mind. But, you know, <laughs> what if both drivers are completely unpredictable? Well, you know, they're not completely unpredictable. And that's the problem. North Korea has has often used bluster, but it's been, but. In fact, it's been fairly strategic uh, about trying to um, uh, uh, achieve uh, some level of, well, uh, frankly, if, uh, at some level of internal security. If they look around the world, and, and I hate to say this, but they look around the world and they say, well, okay, um, 
Iraq was invaded, uh, uh, didn't ha uh, have nuclear weapons, and we're not. And 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 there's there's clear evidence. As I say, even it, it, the Kim Jong Un's fa father was willing to negotiate and, and and came to the table with South Korea to talk about potentially normalizing relations at some level. I think I think any uh, any country would any individual would realize that that they are insane to to uh, to attack either the United States or Russia or any of the major nuclear powers because the United States as I say has uh, uh, all the countries have overkill the ballistic missile that the reason a ballistic missile is called ballistic is because it follows a trajectory that is governed by Newton's laws of physics that means when it lands you know exactly where it came from and it gives a big X mark for obliteration and I think uh, we, we we have to realize at this time that a lot of the bluster and, and, and unfortunately, there's a, there's a lot of, as you say, game playing back and forth and, and games of chicken. But, uh, but so far, the, the North Koreans have, have, them, have always stepped back from, from, from the brink at this level because um, they use their bluster to, uh, internally and externally. But uh, I can't imagine that Kim Jong-un doesn't realize that, okay. that, that while he could certainly, maybe, uh, create a devastating blow for the United States or some other country uh, that, that it would it would be it, it result in essentially instant obliteration and not just for him but for millions around uh, in the in South Korea as well I, I think that that we're as I, and I want to indicate once again there's no evidence right now that North Korea has the capability to do any of the things it claims to do it can do what is what people are confused by that? I'm sure they're like, "What do you mean? The well, sirens were well, going in North Japan." North Korea has been able to uh, has been able to demonstrate two things: that it can explode nuclear weapons, and although it said it's had a hydrogen bomb, there's no evidence it has a hydrogen bomb. That uh, the the strength of the explosion was not anywhere near the large hydrogen bombs that were used in the, by other countries. And it has it can demonstrate it has ballistic missiles. But putting those two things together to make a weapon is very very different. You have to make sure. The, the nuclear weapon is small enough, but you also have to make sure it can survive the intense heat uh, uh, that when a ballistic m missile goes out into space and comes back. And you know when you've seen the, the spacecraft come back uh, from space, there's huge fires and, and uh, uh, the heat generated is intense. And you have to be able to have an incredibly sophisticated system that can only survive that infall through space, but also be able to operate and, uh, and have the electronics work to be able to do what it's supposed to do. And uh, uh, those need, none of those capabilities are, are yet demonstrated. The point, though, is that we shouldn't wait till they are. We should try and develop diplomatic... Okay, uh, I have to hold you there. We're running off to the safe. news. Maybe we'll get back to, to that in the latter half of the program. We've got Peter on the line waiting as well, and Steve in Ottawa. We have Professor Lawrence Krauss. He's a theoretical physicist at Arizona State University, one of the scientists who helps to set the doomsday clock. Uh, we're going to take a break. You can hear, hear Nana. This is the German version, by the way. She apparently never liked the English translation of 99 Red, or Luftballons, as you may know it, uh, and has never sung the English version. version. We're opening up the phone lines, one 817 8995 Maybe you have a question you'd like to put to uh, Lawrence Krauss. You heard one of his former professors from Carleton. Gave him two A-pluses, I think he said. We're back in 90 seconds. You're listening to Ontario Today. In this hour... A man you can bait with a tweet is not a man we can trust with nuclear weapons. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. The board takes the unprecedented step the first time in its history. It is now two and a half minutes to midnight. Open lines with one of the scientists who sets the doomsday clock. one 817 8995 Our Twitter handle is at CBC Ontario Today. It's interesting to me to see that the nuclear issue, which over time has been has raised and lowered in importance, the public doesn't seem to think about it, but it is still the major threat, the major existential threat to civilization. And we still have a thousand nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert. 
Professor Lawrence Krauss is a theoretical physicist at Arizona State University, one of the scientists who helps to set that doomsday clock. He chairs the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists Board of Sponsors. He's got a number of publications, including his new book called The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far, Why Are We Here? I see you tackle all the light subjects. <laughs> the Let's, light sub Let's go back to the phones. Uh, Peter, uh, where are you calling us from? Uh, Toronto. Okay, go right ahead. I, you've, you've been, I know you've been on the phone for a while listening, and maybe even your original impulse has changed somewhat, but what have you been thinking about these days, or do you have a direct question for Lawrence Krauss? Well, so far I've, I've heard the uh, the issue brought up about the public being um, should be aware and get involved, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, yet it's just been vague, very vague generalities about, from your guest on that issue, unlike taxes or, say, the H1N1 uh, topic or terrorism or climate change issues. Individuals can get involved on their own little world, their own little way, yet this is an issue uh, where I don't see anything being positive brought up on the topic except to create stress and, and make people anxious and create tension. Let's face it, there's not a thing your guest or you or I can do um, to to bring this tension down. You can write well, all the letters uh, you want uh, to Kim Jong-un. And the fact is, he also said none of those capabilities are, are seem to be evident yet. So why is the clock being moved ahead if none of the capabilities are uh, or seem to be uh, uh, evident that this guy's uh, dangerous and uh, with his button. And and also it's just tiring seeing the Kim Jong-un being made less of an evil person often than, than Trump. You know, it's the bravado that Trump, of Trump, that gets all the airwaves. And yet this lunatic, and he is a loose cannon lunatic, there's, you know, you can have a billion people write letters who won't do a thing. Simple fact. Well, it, well, actually, that's no, no, you, you were incorrect in a few of your remarks, so I don't have time to go through all of them. But, but first of all, the, we've not said we're moving the clock forward this year, so we'll wait and see what happens. We move the clock forward, in fact, not in response to, to, to Kim Jong-un. In fact, we move the clock forward in response to the, to, the, to the loose cannon that you were talking about earlier. But, but one thing where you're very wrong is that is people think that they can't have an impact on politicians. They can. Uh, it, people uh, in, in, in the United States, at least, and I'm pretty certain the same is true for, for members of Parliament in Canada, if an office receives 10 phone calls in a day on a certain issue, that can have a huge impact. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is encourage um, politicians to take an attitude which is one where diplomacy will work. The Iran nuclear deal is a great example of how diplomacy can work. It diffused a tense situation that might have been military and came to a compromise which with both countries accepted which has reduced that threat incredibly there are clear examples where this can work what if you think about people lashing out usually people lash out when they feel threatened if 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 the united states can convince and state publicly that they have no intent for uh, to destabilize north korea that they have no intent to invade or attack north korea that their intent is to try and produce a peaceful coexistence of countries and not infringe upon the sovereignty of that country, then that will go a long way to to uh, uh, arresting the situation. Uh, the to do point with the is that, that 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 there's every bit of evidence that King Jong Un, as and as stated, is using these as a defensive mechanism. He does not trust the United States. What the United States and other countries need to do is demonstrate that that as we did with Iran, we can. Uh, try and live peacefully together. And, and so you and others can, by writing politicians, and, and of course in Canada, uh, uh, it's probably less significant at this point than in the United States, you can actually impact, in this case, members of Congress or, 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 or Parliament. It doesn't, take, it doesn't take thousands of people in a given constituency. If, someone, if, a, if, a, if a congressman or a member of Parliament receives just a few phone calls on a certain issue, it can cause them to act. I wonder, Peter. Just a quick thought from you: Is that do you feel like that's the tangible okay, thing? Does that answer the tangible no, part? No, it's just it's so it's such a general statement. If I can't get responses on things that directly affect my life, like crushing taxes and so on, uh, that has to do with me, my country, my constituency, any everything within Canada. If I don't get responses there, you, you, does this guy really expect uh, Kim Jong Un to pay attention to me? Not Kim, I'm not talking about Kim Jong Un. I'm talking about people thinking. that you can have an impact on. Okay. And look, no. 
the fact that you haven't received responses means you, have, you, you, you know, everyone is in a situation where they can work locally to impact on global events. Gonna, it, it, I, seems, I, it's, it, it seems very uh, daunting, but it's happened. It's happened many times from the war in Vietnam to, in fact, nuclear disarmament issues. And, and, and people can act locally. You can work with your local groups, you can, you, your schools or churches or whatever you're a member of. And it, you're right, it seems very daunting. And I know it does, but you can either choose to give up and just let, let people uh, go ahead and do what they want. Or in fact, one thing you can do is choose to what, do what I try and do and what the Bolton tries to do, which is educate people. So during the next election, they might vote for people okay. who have rational policies. Okay, so I'm going to just intervene that, that A democracy only works if you have an informed electorate. Well, I'm glad, and part I'm, of this is informing the electorate. Listen, I'm glad, Peter, you got through, though, because it's good to, this is where the rubber hits the road, right? <laughs> Real people. So it's, I, yeah. I, I like that he made you work hard. Um, Steve, <laughs> no, you're, I, fine. Yeah, Steve, you're in Ottawa. Go right ahead. Uh, do you have a question or a comment? I do, thanks. I'm so glad we're talking about this. I mean, this kind of thing does keep me up at night, and, and there is, I understand the sense of powerlessness, but we are here in Canada, and so we have to focus on what our Canadian government can do. And, and my question is about this, you know, like, like, like while the threats are going back and forth, at the same time at the United Nations over the last few months, there's actually been a new treaty worked yes. out called the Ban Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty or the Prohibition Treaty. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's the first movement in a generation uh, to begin to put the issue back on the table, and lots of countries are signing it. And when this was raised in, in Parliament, people were really surprised, uh, you know, whether Canada would sign on and join with the 50 or 100 other countries that are signing. Our Prime Minister said it was useless because the nuclear weapon states wouldn't agree to give up their nuclear weapons. Well, that just seems kind of ridiculous to me um, and very disappointing, especially since, uh, you know, if Donald Trump and other nuclear weapon states are actually sending memos to NATO countries to say, don't you dare sign this, well, gee, that says to me, maybe this thing is important after all. Steve, can I so, ask you, it, like, why does it keep you up at night? Like, and why do you know some, because, you, you know, you're obviously deeper along the spectrum. You, you, do you study this? Or is it a field that you work in? Well, yes. I mean, I've, I've followed this for many years and have worked for nuclear disarmament. I'm actually, you know, I grew up in the Cold War. I remember the day after and all the movies, and I read On the Beach when I was in seventh grade by mm. Neville Shute, and it was my first experience with it, mm. and continue to go to, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki remembrance ceremonies because it is, I agree, this is the, 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 the big issue that... Uh, could wipe us out in a wipe us out in a flash. Well, and but, I wonder if if um, even our guests might might go reflect on this because I've talked to a lot of friends, obviously, and colleagues in the days and how trying to figure out how, how do I do a show on this. Um, like, what's different? I mean, do we need even a doomsday clock to tell us that we're in dangerous times? You know, you know, a certain generation ago, people would go to Europe and they go on the trains with their past. They weren't worried about the trains blowing up. I mean, it just feels that there's a lot of other things in the world that are different and that the nuclear threat maybe has been a sleeper thing for, for a long while. Professor Krebs? Well, it, it, it has been a sleeper thing. And I, and I mean, a, a good example of why I think we need the doomsday clock is I wouldn't be talking to you right now about an issue that we need to deal with if it weren't for that symbol. Uh, uh, and and it, so it causes people to talk about these things, think about them, and maybe to get back to the last listener to act. But your current, the current question asked by the, the listener is a very good one. Yes. Canada, Canadians may feel like they're not part of the problem, and therefore they can relax. And, and you know, and, and, and as someone who grew up in Canada, I've off, I, I know that feeling. But Canada can be a, a force for good or bad. And, uh, and there's many times where diplomacy in Canada has, has impacted on the world. Of course, when I was in, living in Ottawa, actually, Lester Pearson had won a Nobel Prize for, for, for impacting positively dipl with diplomacy. And I think Canada, to say, it, I think it's perfect. I think realistically, what the Prime Minister said, that, that this won't cause the United States to disarm is absolutely true. And, but to say it's useless to send a message that, that other countries around the world seriously think something has to be done, I think it's very unfortunate, and if, and 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 uh, uh, it 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 would be it would be it would send a strong signal if if other Western developed countries all agree to sign this particular nuclear weapons uh, ban treaty because it would indicate that we really need to move towards a world with fewer nuclear weapons. Do you see a world we, of but, complete disarmament, like from your perspective, because you know this stuff? Do you ever imagine that that could happen? 
Well, of course, I, I'm paid to imagine things. I'm a theoretical <laughs> physicist. And, 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 <laughs> true enough <laughs> but you know and so certainly it's possible is it possible in the near future no but what we can do is move towards that goal and and the world you know the united states would be safer with half as many nuclear weapons because it's not just a, it's not just a use against other countries it's a, it's the possibilities for accidents here it's the fact that that the modernization of nuclear weapons is going to cost a trillion dollars in an economy that desperately needs money for other things so we should realize that money we spend in one thing, it takes away from money we can spend on other things, useful infrastructure, health, welfare, those sorts of things. And so uh, we can we can definitely say that we'd be safer with fewer nuclear weapons. And I think that alone is an important goal to just get countries to come back to the table, not just with North Korea, but the United States and Russia. Uh, and as I say, Canada and other countries can be a part of the solution. I, I remember um, uh, when I was I was back in Ottawa a bunch of years ago, you know, under Greta Carlton, and, and at that time there was a, a push uh, under the George W. Bush for for Canada to become part of a missile defense system, which was useless. And and Canada can choose to either agree to become part of the problem or agree to become part of the solution. Lawrence Krauss is with us. He chairs the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists Board of Sponsors. This is the group that adjusts uh, the doomsday clock. It is an analogy that came out of the Cold War of uh, where the state of the world, the existential uh, state of the world. We didn't get into this too much, but uh, you folks yes. also add in climate change now, so it's not just the, the nuclear threats. I want to mention we've tweeted out um, the link to the website for this, the, uh, the, the the uh, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, a lot of really interested curated articles. So if you're interested in this, or this is sparking an interest for you, you're listening to our guests saying, you know, I want to know more. Um, Look, can I jump in yeah. and just say one thing? That's something that's very important that the Bulletin really does, and it gets back to your other listener. We produce articles by experts that are read by policymakers in, this, in the United States and around the world. And that's one way we really can affect things, by actually trying to bring reality and facts rather than hyperbole. So sorry to interrupt, but I no, think that's no. a really important aspect of the bulletin. It's been a bit of uh, interesting bedtime reading for me the last two nights <laughs> since I connected with you. But even the headline, you know, are Switzerland and Sweden the keys to easing the North Korean crisis? It goes in a lot of, we're not going to be able to cover this in 50 minutes on the radio. Sure. Maybe you'll come back sometime. Uh, Miriam, you're next. You're in Windsor. Tell us um, what, your perspective. I think you, you're a microbiologist. Yes, I'm a clinical microbiologist, and just recently a new, you know, new to being a grandmother. So my concern when I hear this kind of news is like, oh my God! Number one, I was worried about climate change. Number two, I know that historically the world has suffered plagues and all kinds of biological kill effect from all kinds of organisms. We got this malaria drug resistance strain out there now. So now it's nuclear and I'm kind of like if, if you factor in all of climate change biological possibilities really what can I do about it I know I can do something for climate change I know biological stuff I'm not going to go to malaria ridden countries or parasit ridden countries but I, I want a future for my grandchildren and my children and how can I do something before I let uh, our, our guest maybe answer it because I don't know if you're asking for a specific um, remedy or not but let me ask you how old is your grandchild by the way oh six weeks old oh, okay just a new wee thing well what I was gonna turn the mirror back on you and say so in your real life world right that sphere of influence of your life I mean how do you talk about it how do you talk to young people or you know do you play into it do you just turn away do you go looking for more information or do you just sort of well, cringe you know, and turn I, off the TV yeah, no, this is, well, uh, on the other hand, I've also, I'm a liveaboard sailboat person for five, six, seven months of the year. So I have a very small stamp on the world as far as energy and needs are concerned, and I can live really small. So my kids see us live this type of life, and it's great. It's sort of like, that's how you talk, that's what you do. But yeah, do we have that dialogue out on the table with them? Not recently, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I have a five-year-old. Yeah. It's not stuff. I mean, he asks me every day what I do on the radio. I haven't answered the question for today. But, uh, <laughs> Lawrence Hard Krauss, yeah, go, go ahead. Well, what does Miriam have you thinking about? Well, you know, I think it's important that, you know, the purpose, you don't, you don't need to unduly scare children. And that was a big problem when I was a kid because of those, those ridiculous, uh, exercises in schools mm -hmm. but i think what we tried I, look there, there's a famous statement 
If the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I'm an educator. Right. And I think what we can do is try and educate people about the situation so that they can act more more uh, positively and certainly and know which things can be, we can do something about it, which things we can't. But let's remember that the, when you feel daunted, that the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which was probably the major treaty reducing reducing nuclear threats in the world, came into force in 1970. That was during the time of Richard Nixon, okay, who wasn't a notably pacifist president. It came into effect because there was a massive public movement to support after, in fact, it was the explosion of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere that convinced people, look, this is this is not just playing around. This stuff is dangerous. Even in the in even in not having a war, this stuff has to be taken into account. We have moved backward many times, and and of course, and as people will point out, we've lived seventy over seventy years with nuclear weapons without their use against the civilian population. And there's been a lot of people working hard. And there are a lot of people still working hard around the world, diplomats and other people, trying to ensure that we, we can live in peace. But the public needs to demonstrate an interest in this. And, you know, I write pieces all the time in lots of subjects and in lots of magazines and newspapers around the world. And I'm often sadly surprised when, that, when I write about nuclear weapons, there's almost no response. It's the one area where people seem to say... I'd rather not think about it. Oh, but, that's interesting. But, we, you know, and it's one thing to say we shouldn't scare people, but we can't, we have to face the world as it really is. And there are real, real dangers. And to pretend they don't exist and to pretend we can't do anything about them is to ensure that we won't do anything about them. And uh, we have to realize that we, we can and we need to, that our future is in our hands. I, this is a perfect place I'd, I'd like to ask you because it gives you an opportunity to, to talk about perhaps your latest book. But I know we did tweet out uh, a piece you wrote about a year ago, I guess, in October, The Real Nuclear Threat, which was in The New Yorker. When you say, what, what sorts of things do people contact you about? Or, or is it more when you get into debates about religion, for example? Is that where you hear from people and not on pieces uh, like this? If I mention the word religion, yes, I will get a thousand, a thousand response. If I mention Donald Trump. Uh, it, it'll produce and whatever I may say about him uh, or even, uh, you know, or and I'm happy to say this when I write a positive piece, as I just did recently about about uh, uh, the, the Voyager spacecraft uh, that have left the solar system. Humanity finally has a something that will survive no matter what happens to us and go out into the cosmos and maybe one day discovered happily that kind of thing inspires people. But, yeah, religion, um, uh, individual politics. Uh, but but no matter but different kinds of politics, even climate change, of course, will produce a remarkable response. Usually a hateful one, but nevertheless a response. Nuclear weapons, I, I don't even get hate mail. Okay, <laughs> okay, let's go back to the phones because I have a ton of listeners who aren't going to all make it on the air. But I, I wanted them to understand the breadth of who you are, at least give a glimpse, because of course you were also in a documentary called The Unbelievers. They would know the the name of Richard Dawkins uh, and you, uh, and it follows both of you. You know, as you go around the world discussing science and reason, uh, and again a number of books, including this latest one. I should give the title again, uh, called The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far. Why are we here? No, sometimes. It, it, it's they associate the greatest story ever told to a biblical story, but this book is not that. You want thirty no, seconds? That's right. It's about the real world, which is uh, as to be opposed to the biblical story, which is I like to say is the goat herder's guide to the universe. See, now you're going to get lots of email. We're going <laughs> yeah, exactly. to go back to your role here today with the doomsday clock, uh, James in Oakville. Do you have a question for our guest? Uh, it, it was more just a, a general comment, I guess, about the situation. Uh, I mean, your guest mentioned how. Uh, technically challenging it is to launch one of these missiles and and that just got me thinking i mean it, it a lot of people don't realize this but canada is actually in the flight path between these two countries if they chose to go to war um you know and, and if there's any problems <clears throat> i mean obviously it would be bad if the u.s got hit because i mean they're a trading partner and next door neighbor so we'd obviously be affected but you know if there's a problem with one of the missiles uh they could drop on us too and so we, we certainly have some sort of interest in that. And I was just thinking, you know, Canada loves to, to play the peacekeeper role. Well, why not have our Canadian diplomats then start reaching out to North Korea? Because my understanding is Canada is actually viewed positively in North Korea. So we would be a, an ideal broker between the two. And what for, for you, James, when you think of Canada in the flight path, what does that mean to you? Uh, well, I certainly don't want to see anything happen to uh, to Canada in general. I mean, I I grew up during the uh, the 80s 
uh, you know, love watching all that that stuff. Love Land of Confusion. Uh, that was uh, de- definitely a, a uh, as a child, kind of a scary time to grow up in. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's you know, hopefully you, you you really hope that the world leaders understand. You know, war is a, a last resort, and there's no such thing as nuclear war. It's nuclear holocaust. But you know, and I'm I'm actually as as your guest also pointed out, North Korea is actually very strategic. And I get the feeling there might actually be some uh, wherewithal as to what they're doing there. And I, I'm not so sure <laughs> right now, at least on the American side. Okay. Uh, you seem to have somebody that's very easy to go there. Yeah, and um, well, you said a lot, a lot, James. Go ahead, uh, Lawrence Krauss. Well, you look, you're, you're, James, you point out something very interesting, and that, that is that no country is an island when it comes to when it comes to these global issues, be it climate change or nuclear weapons. Canada, it's true, is you know is is not a, a major nuclear player, but but we all are uh, will be impacted by any kind of any kind of nuclear confrontation. That's not just the economic aspects and the uh, and the political aspects. But, you know, again, I, I don't want to seem I'm trying to scare people, but, you know, India and Pakistan have a huge rivalry. Each of them have about a, of several hundred nuclear weapons. It's been shown that if there was a, a, a nuclear uh, confrontation between those two countries with 50 nuclear weapons, for example, exploded, as far remote and removed as you can imagine from Canada, that in fact the effects in the atmosphere would affect agriculture around the world for 10 years. And people have argued there, there could be as many as a billion people die of starvation in various countries because of that. So these no country is immune, and can, Canadians should not imagine that, that, that the threat is just against the United States. States, we all, we're living in, a, in the 21st century. We are having a global impact on the world in many ways, climate change, cyber issues, and nuclear weapons. And we have to start acting like global citizens. And Canada, you're absolutely right, is well positioned in many ways to take a positive role in diplomacy. The article in the bulletin was talking about Sweden and Switzerland, which are two countries that are well known to have helped kind of broker diplomatic relations. But Canada does have a distinguished history in that regard, too. And there's no reason that Canadian diplomats couldn't uh, take an active role in that regard. Okay. I feel like I thought that was an interesting read. I don't think we'll have time to talk about it because I'd like to bring in Ron, too, in Toronto, because I think you have a kind of a personal dimension to add to this. Go right ahead. Oh, hi. Uh, thanks for taking the call. Uh, yeah, well, uh, it's kind of uh, important for me. I've been to, uh, I have in-laws in Japan, and uh, I've been to Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and it's uh, like they're sort of, uh, you know, there's nothing they can do, right? And uh, this has ramped up the, uh, you know, the politics in Japan, the uh, Japanese self-defense force is uh, changing the uh, constitution, or Abe's uh, trying to change the constitution, and uh you know, uh, you know, uh, there's a number of things here, and I commend you for talking about India and Pakistan because that's the flashpoint. The Can I just ask you, Ron, that... because we're not, we're almost out of time, in fact, we're in the last moment of the yeah. show, but when, when this happened, even, you know, the, the TV screens, did you talk about that in your family? Because I have a friend, actually, who's friends in Japan, and that yeah, stuck with yeah, me. Like, we, just there was, run! There was some discussion that was it. About it but there's, 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 uh, there's, well, you know, we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, one minute, one minute, and, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing that they can do. And even if there's, uh, even if something, the United States tries to uh, to do something, uh, the the uh, the missile flyovers would be over Russia and uh, China to retaliate. So how is China going to decide if it's a benign nuclear missile flying over them? towards North Korea. I'd like your uh, guest to comment on that. Okay, go ahead. Uh, we're we're cl- close to the end of the program, but go ahead, Lawrence Krauss, if you can. Well, uh, you're right. It's hard in the last minute or two to comment. Uh, the point is that we shouldn't get to that point. Uh, that, that you're right, that these the ballistic missiles can move across continents in, in minutes, and and, uh, and, uh, and there's no rational r- response. There's no, uh, there's no rational use of those things. We have to take the take instead of work. I mean, we sh- we should recognize that danger, but we should work be working very hard to make sure that that isn't a possibility, and that means we, uh, that means we have to engage. Diplomacy is not to talk to people that you like; it's to talk to people that you don't like, and that's the point. Listen, uh, we are at a time where it's been really a pleasure to have you, and I'm not kidding. I hope you'd make time again, because there is an appetite I can attest to. There's dozens of people calling through uh, who won't have a chance today uh, to talk with you. Professor Lawrence Krauss, thanks for being with us. 